Welcome back to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is the current member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands, and she is running as a pair to be the next, well, I guess I can say the first co-leaders of the Green Party of Canada. Please welcome Elizabeth May. Elizabeth, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you, Chris. It's great to be on your program. So, uh, Elizabeth, the very first question I've asked to every single politician or candidate to be a politician is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Definitely um, through through my mom and my grandma. Uh, my my mother was raised uh, with the, the this kind of strong family motto that thought without constructive action is demoralizing. So I was raised by a mom who thought, well, if something's wrong in society, it's my job to fix it. She didn't really have a, any sense of, um, well, <laughs> she had no sense of learned powerlessness, that's for sure. She actually, when I was a baby, she discovered that nuclear weapons testing was distributing uh, radionuclides globally and that this was going to cause, doctors said, an increase in childhood leukemia. So my mom got organized and, and she no organization backing her or whatever. I mean, she's just in kind of her generation, you know, a, a suburban mom version of Greta Thunberg. She just got busy and she organized. So I was raised knowing, as far as I was concerned, by the time I was in grade one, my mommy had stopped nuclear weapons testing. And then we worked on other issues. By the time I was in high school, I decided environmental work was where I was going to put my the focus of my energy. But I, I, I never had... Um, I don't quite how to describe it. I had the sense of mission for my entire life. And regardless of whether I was practicing law or running an environmental group, because I was executive director of Sierra Club of Canada for 17 years. And then I didn't get into politics till I was in my 50s. Uh, that whole time, I was driven by the same thing and just figured you need different tools for different times. And I realized that um, as Stephen Harper became prime minister, in a minority parliament in 2006, that environmental groups were in for a rough ride. And really to confront what was going to be coming at us, I, I should accept the challenge I've been getting with lots of calls from friends in the Green Party saying, why don't you run for leader of the Green Party? Now, that was that was a long time ago, but here we go again, although it does. But the question, where does it come from? It's kind of it, it's it's part of my DNA. I don't know how to describe it. You, you talked about that first election that you were elected as the first elected Green MP for Canada. I want to ask this question because I, I try to ask this question to whoever has served in the House of Commons. You were mm -hmm. one of thousands of Canadians who have had the honor and pr privilege to walk into that building as an elected representative. That very first time that you walked onto the floor of the House of Commons, what was that experience like? was terrific and humbling uh, but I also I felt like I was hitting the ground running because unlike many of my colleagues who became MPs and they are friends I regard you know there's 338 members of parliament right now we are in our own way a community and I care about each and every one of my colleagues really I do and one of the things I learned from actually in terms of what I was going to do when I first got elected Deb Gray was a friend of mine and of course she was the first elected reform party MP Deb Gray now lives on Vancouver Island so we're, we're you know, closer geographically but she was she's a fantastic person but she had a horrible time as the first reform MP I mean, she just took a lot of abuse from all quarters and she was lonely so I started out I thought well I don't want to be I don't want to be lonely in this place I mean it was obvious that if I got elected in 2011, I was going to be the country's only green. So the constituents of Saanich Gulf Islands took one heck of a risk. They, they, the, the, the MP I defeated was a member of the cabinet. Gary Lund was a member of Stephen Harper's cabinet, and they were electing pretty clearly it's going to be the only green MP. Anyway, I decided I didn't want to be lonely and I wanted to make friends. So I and there was a big turnover that year. There were 110 newly elected MPs. So I organized a party and I called it Come and Break the Ice. And it was the non-party party. And I had my my volunteers and staff made name tags for everybody that were just your first name. So as few as possible 
visual clues that you were talking to a newly elected conservative or a newly elected liberal. I mean, if you were talking to someone who looked under 25, you could be pretty sure they were a newly elected new Democrat from Quebec, but otherwise you have no clues. And we had a lovely time and it, the questions you would normally ask, like, have you found an apartment yet? Do you have an office yet? Do you know, you know what you're doing yet? And the other parties take their MPs and when they're elected, they put them through that some they call it some of parties call it boot camp, where you're told you don't need to read the rule book. People will tell you that <laughs> stuff. You don't need to do this. We'll tell you how to vote on every bill. You don't have to read every bill. Whereas I went in saying, okay, I better read the whole rule book. I gotta know how you know. And so the Greens have created a space which is, I think, although more challenging, a lot more rewarding because you're your own boss. And what no matter how many other Green MPs I've worked with, and we have been successful in electing more. Uh, you're really, you're training up the new MPs to know how to use the rules to serve your own constituents, not just to be a kind of a cookie cutter version of what the leader wants you to be. And so we have a different experience as Greens in Parliament, but I have to say, I love it. And that first moment walking in and taking my seat, just, I was thrilled. We are in the midst of a Green Party of Canada leadership race. You have decided after 2019 stepping down as the sole leader uh, to make a comeback, but this time as in a co-leadership uh, uh, realm uh, with your co-leadership candidate, Jonathan Pendow. And I apologize if I pronounced his name wrong. I did it during our interview with him, and I'm probably going to do it uh, uh, incorrectly during the debate. But what was that decision based on? What was the decision based on of coming back after a few years of stepping away from that leadership role and coming back into a co-leadership role if you are so lucky on October uh, in in November no November 19th yeah November 19th sorry yeah no it's like it was a two-stage process first of all all the interviews that I did after stepping down as leader uh back in 2019 I there was nothing duplicitous in my answers when I say no I'm not running again no not what changed my mind was on April 4th the intergovernmental panel on climate change so the the toughest, most rigorous science body planet has ever seen, basically. I mean, humanity's never c- constructed a peer review process as rigorous as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they, and I've been tracking them since 1988 when I was in government and Canada was one of the leaders in creating the IPCC. They are, and, and I know in Alberta, people don't believe this. They think there's some kind of well, I won't generalize, but people speak of the IPCC from some conservative party ranks as if it is a discredited bunch of loonies. It is the most small C conservative group of scientists. Every bit of advice they've ever given has been small C conservative. It's been, they've they've historically, empirically, always overestimated how much time we have and underestimated how extreme it could get. So when the IPCC put in one sentence on April 4th, which was the final chapter of the it spanned 2021 into 2022 six assessment report these reports come out on the order of every six to seven years so it's not a daily bulletin they put in this one sentence that holding to 1.5 degrees or two could only happen if global emissions peaked between 2020 and at the latest before 2025 now that sentence meant to me for the first like I knew we didn't have a lot of time and we declared a climate emergency in parliament in June of 2018. And in October of 2018, the IPCC put out a special report on can we hold to 1.5? Yes, but only with immediate action. And what's the difference between 1.5 and two? They're both dangerous, but two degrees is a lot more dangerous. Well, reading that sentence uh, put me into a crisis. Uh, I, I can't describe it as any other than a personal crisis, Chris, trying to figure out what the hell do I do? I'm working on climate change. I'm an elected member of parliament, parliamentary leader of the Green Party. I put these questions to Justin Trudeau. I put these questions to Stephen Gibo, now Minister of Environment, an old friend of mine, and they kind of the equivalent of pat me on the head. They say, oh, thank you for all your years of work and blah, blah, blah. And then blah, 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 as Greta Thunberg says, we're going to get to net zero by 2050, which means exactly nothing If you don't track what I had just said, that both 1.5 and 2 become impossible. 
if global emissions don't stop increasing and start decreasing or peak before 2025. The other part of my brain that was freaking out was, well, the NDP have given the liberals a blank check till 2025. So the window on a livable world for my grandchildren is going to close before the next election. And I'm sitting here in parliament. What should I do? I started thinking about quitting parliament, maybe just trying to find a place for global activism where I'd make a bigger difference. And as I went out and talked to people about what do I do to make a bigger difference on climate, the answer came back, well, why aren't you running for leader of the Green Party? It, 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 that's the best place to be to talk about climate in Canada. Wow. So then I started thinking, well, I know that I've learned enough from my previous experience as leader to know that structurally we've got some issues as a party. And I'd come to the dis conclusion some years ago that co-leadership was a better model. Oh, now, here's a funny piece of trivia for Calgary viewers, and I don't imagine, I don't know how many of your people watch from what part of the country, but there's co-leadership in green parties around the world, including in Scotland, where co-leader Lorna Slater is from Calgary. Just in, if She doesn't even have a, Calgary, a, a Scottish accent yet. So she's the co-leader of the Scottish Greens, and she's in cabinet in Scotland, but there are co-leaders. The German Greens go with co-leadership. They're both now in the cabinet of Germany, ditto for New Zealand. But one of my closest friends in the global green family of elected MPs is uh, uh, Carolyn Lucas, who was one year ahead of me, the first green elected anywhere in the world to a parliament in a country run under first past the post voting. So Carolyn was elected in 2010 in Brighton Pavilion. We've, been, we've become very close friends. But when she had to come back, having quit being leader and then coming back later, came back with a co-leader and with the commitment that Jonathan Pedno and I now have to take the party through a series of constitutional changes, all of which depend on how the members vote. Do the members want to go to co-leadership? If they don't, we don't. But we're, I think there's a strong appetite for co-leadership. It emerged during the 20. 20 leadership race, a lot of questions to the candidates then. What do you think of co-leadership? So I know it's a very, very, very long answer because it was a two-part process. First, realizing, okay, I got to do this. I've got to run for leader of the Green Party, but I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to pretend that the way things functioned then was working particularly well. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think the structural change to demonstrating distributed leadership to, to job sharing will work really, really well with me in Parliament. Eventually, Jonathan will be in Parliament. But for the for the years of rebuilding the party to be election ready for the next federal campaign, uh, I think it's it's going to be genius. And and when I met Jonathan I, at this point, of course, I'm attuned to well, if I'm going to run in co leadership, where's the candidate that, with whom I could be a co leader? And that's when I met Jonathan. So that was kind of like unbelievably great timing and fortunately for me when I suggested it to him he didn't say um you're a crazy lady he just said oh hmm interesting let me get out to BC and we'll talk about it so I'm very fortunate so I I, I had Jonathan on the show and he talked I, I asked him this question what if you don't agree on issues because let's be honest, he's from Montreal. You're from uh, Vancouver. Um, if you talk to people in Vancouver and Montreal, they relatively don't have a lot that they agree on, if anything. They well, do they agree on, back, on the big issues. Vancouver issue. Islanders and Montreal, <laughs> definitely. No, no pipelines. <laughs> we got that, you know. But but no, but Greens are, uh, well, your question. Of course, intelligent people shouldn't agree on everything. It would show a kind of a... Something funny. That's one of the things about the other parties and whipped votes every single time. I mean, you, you, to viewers, believe me, the pages walk out this beautiful young university students and each whips desk gives all the pages for every single vote. The instruction sheet for how all the other parties are going to vote. It's very interesting. At um, one time, it was it was quite a long time ago. I think it was, it was right after I was first elected in 2011. One of my liberal colleagues who had just gotten his voting instruction turned around and said to me, so Elizabeth, how do you know how to vote? And then laughed because he just like, like, this is so, I mean, why we get intelligent, community-minded people to run for parliament, to be MPs, and then say, oh, by the way, you can check your brain at the door because we're going to tell you every word that comes out of your mouth has to be pre-approved. And we're going to tell you how you vote. And this is not 
good for democracy. So internally within the Greens, of course, we're not always likely to agree. Um, so Jonathan and I sat down and worked out a, a memorandum of understanding between the two of us, what kind of things would be deal breakers, where we disagree, how we sort out their disagreements. Uh, it's embedded in the Green Party constitution that we resolve conflict through consensus decision-making. Unfortunately, that has not been, uh, it, well, it's been ignored for a while, but it is in the constitution that you work things out and it takes time. So yeah, I, I, Jonathan and I are, are, there's very, I don't think there's much we're gonna disagree on, but we're equal partners and neither one of us is gonna tell the other what to do. We have to, if it's, if it's an important area of conflict, we sit down and talk it through. Um, there are areas of public policy on which we'll disagree, but that's easy because the leader of the Green Party, whether leader or co-leader is at service of the party and the only the membership chooses our policy. So I'll tell you the issue where I know recently, like the don't see eye to eye at all. Um, I, I think that a constitutional monarchy is the right thing for Canada. And I think it's healthy for our democracy. Um, Jonathan doesn't, the idea that you've got a royal family, what? And so you've got, but that's a question for our membership. Our membership has actually uh, never taken on a policy position on whether we should stay a constitutional monarchy, whether we should be a republic. Uh, my reasons are related to watching what happens in the United States where I think it's human nature to want to elevate an elected prime minister if or president, if that person is both head of government and head of state, there's a terrible temptation to turn them into a celebrity culture royal family. Uh, as the, you know, in the US, I mean, first lady and all this kind of first family and all this kind of hoopla, which we don't do in Canada. Prime minister is kind of a, I mean, it does get a bit presidentialized, which I think is dangerous, but the prime minister is not constitutionally a significant player in the life and health of our country. And I like that about constitutional monarchy. And I like that about a prime minister role versus presidential republic stuff but anyway that's just one little time i agree with you wholeheartedly I... on that issue though <laughs> fyi <laughs> elizabeth so i'll just be the first yes. to admit that um i well, want to turn good I, wa I want to turn to the meat and potatoes of the show because i like talking policy policy is where i i i, I enjoy getting into the mind of my guest on policy issues and i want to start with the alberta question because let's be honest, I'm the Alberta show and I know I have some conservative followers who will yell at me if I do not ask the conservative question right off the bat. But I'm not conservative. I'm not liberal. I did run liberal, but I've been honest about that. So I'm going to start with the Alberta question. Our province is tied heavily to the oil and gas industry. We rely on the oil and gas industry for our economy. We have premiers who have said they're going to diversify. And it doesn't happen. It is one of these things that we always fall back on. What is your position on the oil and gas industry in Alberta? And where do you see it, if anywhere, in the national discussion moving forward? Well, Alberta is an incredibly important part of Canada. And I love visiting. And I've got tons of friends there. And including, by the way, I've been interviewed by Daniel Smith, so new premier. I, you know, I... Jason, can't, I still, whenever I see Jason at Calgary Stampede, I don't let him get away with pretending we're not friends because we got <laughs> to be friends when, you know, when he was Minister of Immigration and stuff like that. And I'm friends with Brian Jean for all kinds of longer history. Look, the thing that Albert, we have to deal with this because I think the number one reason Canada has failed to meet any target on climate, we always say Canada's failed to reach the target. You know what? We haven't gotten the direction right yet. It's not like we aimed at a target and missed by a smidge. When we say we're going to reduce emissions, they go up. This has happened over and over again. And, and it's really our failure to be able to deal with federal provincial harmony questions that has stymied action on climate and on other issues too. I mean, I'm, uh, and related to climate, for example, we really need a robust electricity grid. That energy corridor we desperately need. We need to be able to get renewable hydro from BC into Alberta, we need Alberta. Alberta is a powerhouse for renewable energy. I mean, I'm old enough to remember before the oil sands were a thing, right? It was the 1993 election uh, where Anne McClellan won by what was it, 17 votes? And suddenly Jean Chrétien decided to ditch all of his commitments, pretty much all of them, on climate to try to get this, this 
beachhead in Alberta to turn into a lot of liberal votes. I mean, the liberals fool themselves on this over and over again, but never mind. It's been pretty recently that the oil sands went into being a big chunk of Alberta's economy, starting in the early 90s. For me, as someone at 68 years old, that still feels like recently. Peter Lougheed had it right, right? Peter Lougheed had, I mean, there have been as many differences in conservative premiers in Alberta as if they changed parties. I mean, the difference between a thoughtful Peter Lougheed and a Ralph Klein, same party, but, but Ralph Klein ditched Peter Lougheed's thoughtful things like having a heritage fund, like making sure you're not going to live off your oil rents. You're going to make sure you stack it away for when you don't have that anymore. And Norway actually came to Alberta and and duplicated what Peter Lougheed had planned for Alberta, did it in Norway. That's why the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund makes every Norwegian, uh, if you divvy it up, a millionaire a few times over. They did it right. They followed Peter Lougheed's advice. Well, now we're at a place where we have to look at where we are for Alberta. What are the threats of the climate crisis? It's not like Alberta's immune, for God's sakes. I mean, the the fires, um, you know, the, 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 the flooding of Calgary, those were historic events that were clearly the first multi-billion dollar climate event in Canada was the tornado that wiped out the trailer park in Edmonton years ago that so you look at this Alberta's not immune Alberta's glaciers are going to disappear fast that has an effect on recharging to Alberta's uh, agricultural economy Alberta's not immune Albertans are not immune from climate crisis events so what are the responsible choices here well first is stop adding and start subtracting that first sentence I told you that made me freak out and almost quit parliament and join extinction rebellion whatever it was going to take to make a difference Stop adding and start subtracting before 2025, which means no new fossil fuel infrastructure, which means we can't build, we can't finish the TMX pipeline, which, by the way, the people of Canada have already wasted billions on. Uh, let's And the Greens call for, and which a lot of people don't know, let's not be importing any fossil fuels from other countries. Let's use Canadian only on a trajectory that goes like this while we're still, and we're ramping up where Alberta has a competitive advantage for sure in solar, where the Okotoks facility is like, I think it's around three cents a kilowatt hour. It's a world beating price and it should be an energy superpower selling into a grid that can reach Saskatchewan. The grid becomes the giant battery that answers this question. What do you do when the sun's not shining? What do you do when the wind's not blowing? And all the abandoned wells, like we got, what, 100,000 abandoned wells in Alberta. They're a liability on the books of the province of Alberta. Roughly 10% of those, according to Alberta government stats, have heat at depth to produce geothermal electricity at zero carbon. And the big cost of geothermal wells, of course, is drilling them. So you, you can take a liability on the books of the province of Alberta and turn it into a gold mine of clean electricity. You can So there's so much we could do if we talked to each other instead of shouting past each other. So I, I got, I'm, I'm going to ask the, the typical follow-up question. It seems like you want to phase out the oil and gas industry. You don't want to shut off the taps I, tomorrow because I can imagine I, that would just decimate our economy and no one would want that. Um, oh, we have a premier. We have a federal conservative leader we have a prime minister who well the prime minister's stance i don't know where his stance is to be honest but we have a federal conservative leader and a provincial pre premier in alberta who are saying nope that's not going to happen we're going to actually do more we're going to actually do more on this issue yeah. because while they may not believe in climate change, while they may, I don't know their official stance on climate change, they believe that oil and gas will always have a role to play in Canada and particularly Alberta. How do you change mindsets? How do you change mindsets when you have someone so entrenched in an idea? I think you have to start with where there is agreement. And you have to start with, okay, so everybody now says we understand that there's a climate crisis. We understand it's a thing. But we're not being honest with ourselves about what it will take to ensure our kids have a livable world. And I think another place of common ground is our children. Now, I'm, I'm a, a grandmother and a mom, 
and I'll do anything to protect my kids. And if people think that Alberta's children and grandchildren get a safer planet than the rest of us, if we start having, we're, we're, we're at risk of exceeding tipping points that are terribly dangerous, that we, that we create irreversible self-accelerating levels of warming, that's not, that's not good for any of our kids or grandkids. Nobody's immune. And it's, to a certain extent, the richer you are, the longer you can postpone the impacts coming home to roost. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a pretty picture what things look like if we miss holding to 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase. Just put in some context, what we're experiencing right now, we're at about 1.1, some people say 1.2 global average temperature increase above what it was before the industrial revolution. And 100% of the reason for that is our burning of fossil fuels. So no, we're not gonna turn off tomorrow, but we have to be on a declining trajectory to fit the science. And if we don't fit the science, look, the atmosphere isn't interested in negotiating with us. Like, you know, there's fundamental physics and chemistry at work here. And we don't get to say, we've decided to defy gravity because what the hell, we're making a lot of money on, on pretending gravity doesn't exist. I mean, there's, there's real limits here. So let's talk about how we ensure, and I'm very concerned for workers and communities. How do we ensure that if we're saying, for instance, by 2030, producing bitumen to burn it. I mean, there's other places to put bitumen to, where you're not going to burn it, but producing bitumen to burn it's got to pretty well be over by 2030. What's that look like? How do we make that work? How do we ensure that communities and individual families don't take, don't suffer? It's not easy, but if we, the longer we procrastinate, and the longer we believe in fairy tales, like we can have oil and gas forever, and we'll still have a really good climate because we'll be net zero by 2050. That line is hokey. I mean, that's just not, well, the, the, there's no polite word for it. It's, 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 just, it's just a lie. So if you know the science, you think, okay, let's start with that and work together to figure out, given that this is the reality, can we agree that's, that's a reality? Now, that's a big step for a lot of people, but let's look at the science and figure out, being smart people and all Canadian, what's that look like in 10 years time? What's that look like in 20 years time? We do have time to plan. We don't have time to pretend it's not real. That's the biggest difference. In pretending it's not real should have ended a couple of years ago. It uh, definitely should have ended last summer when 700 British Columbians died in four days in the heat dome. Definitely should be over when this year Fiona just hit five provinces. Five provinces were walloped by tropical hurricane storm Fiona and then Hurricane Ian. I mean, we're, we're surrounded on a daily basis by news that since I've been working on the climate issues since 1986, I would have said in 1986, oh, when it gets that bad, nobody will be a denier anymore. Everybody will be on board. And we still have people who are saying, well, yeah, but we've always had storms or equally, you know, magical thinking. Uh, no, we, we haven't had these. What we're dealing with now is a climate emergency and there's science that makes that really clear. And let's talk about it, not yell at each other. I want to turn to another big topic that's on a lot of people's mind right now, and that's the affordability issue across Canada right mm -hmm. now. We are seeing people struggling day to day, week to week, paycheck to paycheck. We are seeing people lose their homes. We are seeing mortgage prices go up. We are seeing inflation at an all time, not an all time high, but at a high that we have not seen in almost 30 years. How yeah. do you see yourself and how do you see the Green Party fit into the discussion around affordability because we Canadians and I say Canadians at uh, the Royal we as Canadians are looking for answers on this file because we need some relief. We need to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And right now Canadians don't see that because they are working harder, longer, and they're not getting it. Well, there's no question that that's on t that's a top of mind issue. I, um, you know, as a member of parliament, I do a, a household or it's called, you probably know the term from having been in politics, you know, the thing that goes to every home. And since I was elected in 2011, every issue of that that I've sent out has been sort of my own idea of what's interesting to read. I don't send out, you know, pictures of myself cutting ribbons. I usually address an issue. I did inflation for the last one I sent my, my constituents because 
this isn't normal inflation. This is a very different animal. This is really unusual in that, um, you know, what people talk about a K-shaped recovery. So coming out of COVID, I mean, during COVID, initially the thought was housing values will be depressed because we're going into COVID. The opposite happened right? People started saying, well, if I can work from anywhere, I'd like a place with more space and I'll get that by leaving downtown Vancouver and buying a place in Mission. I mean, that, that went, and then the people in my riding who, as everywhere across Canada, anything to do with home renovations and the price of lumber. So things were wonky. And then we came out of COVID and the the smart people, like the governor of the Bank of Canada, and I'm, I, I attend finance committee and Stephen Polos had said when asked about inflation, oh, he said, that's a problem I'd love to have. I'm more worried about deflation. Something snuck up on us here. And the number one driver of prices going nuts in terms of the day-to-day -day prices uh, going, you know, hitting 20, 30-year highs was Putin declaring war in Ukraine and the impact that had on the price of, of a barrel of oil and energy prices. Meanwhile, we also had the Bank of Canada saying, wait, we're gonna adjust our rates. We had historically low rates, like zero interest payments. So it was a great time to borrow and government of Canada was borrowing like crazy. Well, it turned out of course, that they started increasing quite substantially on, on rates to dampen inflation, I'm very worried that, we'll, that we're gonna see a recession. Same thing south of the border. So Canada's not alone in the world. All of the G20 economies did exactly the same things to deal with COVID. It wasn't like Justin Trudeau alone decided, let's, let's use quantitative easing, otherwise known as printing money and buying lots of bonds to keep our economy stable while we're going through COVID. So this is a very unusual, it's a combination of energy prices, COVID recovery time, and a war. And what we need to do is put, put especially, and you mentioned you started with the price of a house, that's just gone completely out of control to a crisis where Canadians can't afford to own their own home. And young people are, I mean, my husband and I are not young and we don't know, <laughs> we can't afford to own our own home on Vancouver Island. We're renting, but it's, it takes work and it takes being thoughtful. And so I'm, and it also takes being honest with Canadians. This is not going to be solved quickly or easily. We're not gonna snap our fingers and return to kind of a 1950s uh, growth economy. Sorry, but where do we start? Because that's it, the hardest yeah. part of any journey is the first step. And I can imagine as someone who has been served in the House of Commons for some time now, you yeah. have known these players in politics, Justin Trudeau, Pierre Polyev, Jagmeet yeah. Singh, Yves-François Blanchet. Um, what is the first step that we need to take? And what do you see your role as leader or co-leader of the Green Party to say, OK, guys, enough's enough. We need to start yeah. make, taking this seriously because people are struggling and with struggle comes mental health, which comes a burden yeah. on the health system. So what is the first step that you see that the government needs to take? Being honest. And we need to rebuild faith in each other and in our institutions. So it's the worst time in the world to have different facts, right? It's <laughs> one thing to say, but, but this is what's happening coming out of COVID. Some people are quite committed to the set of facts they have that says vaccinations never worked and we shouldn't have done them, right? I mean, that's a different set of issues and conflicts. But the more, I mean, I've always loved saying about Canadians that we can disagree without being disagreeable. We've become more disagreeable of late, a lot more disagreeable. And we've also developed through disinformation sites. And okay, maybe some people say, well, your disinformation site is the CBC. And you're calling my disinformation. Is that I get my real facts from you know, name a website that's kind of an echo chamber for for alt-right views. Okay, let's at least figure out how we can agree on what, I mean, I used to practice law. You, you get into a, into a case, you really want a mutually agreed upon set of facts, and then you can move from there. I'd like us to have a mutually agreed upon set of facts. I'd also like us to get rid of first past the post because that voting system encourages wedge issues and winning on a riding by riding basis. So a, a leader of a party doesn't even have to hope to create 
the you know majority of Canadians or majority of Albertans believing in their solutions. You just have to pick a wedge issue, a dog whistle issue, so you can get enough of your base motivated to get out and vote for you. And then you can get a false majority government, which is what you get with first past the post. I think we really need to be a lot more considerate of each other. Uh, within the Green Party, what Jonathan and I are advocating, and it's it's his phrase, and I really like it, is we have to be prepared to weather the storms. I don't think it's responsible to tell people whether they're in Saanich Gulf Islands reading my newsletter or Green Party members across the country, uh, you know, follow us because we've got all the, the good solutions and just have a bit of our Kool-Aid because it's really better than the other guy's Kool-Aid, right? We're going to believe all kinds of nonsense because it's it's much happy. It's a happier place to believe nonsense. We're in for storms. We're in for climate related storms. We're in for economic storms. So the question is, how do we take care of each other? So as much as Justin Trudeau was standing on the front steps of the, the place he lives while 24 Sussex Drive isn't habitable, he's saying, well, I, we have your back. Well, I know he thinks he has our back, but nobody feels like he has our back. It, 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 when you go to the grocery store and things that you used to be able to fill your shopping cart and not feel like you needed a bank loan to wheel it out of the store. I mean, this is these are very tough times for people. And there are places to go to get some additional resources. One of which, of course, is the big oil and gas companies of the planet are, according to the UN Secretary General, says it's immoral because what they they're, they're basically profiting from war. They've done nothing in terms of business acumen to deserve the off the charts fifty five billion dollar profits globally for oil and gas in one quarter. I mean, off the charts. That should be recouped so that people who are trying to get by have the supports they need because we are going to be weathering storms economic storms real storms because of climate emergency other storms because i'm worried about our health care system what the heck again federal provincial lack of cooperation lack of talking to each other the province is just beat a drum saying send us more money for health care and not for bad reasoning feds say well show us that you're actually using the money that's going to each province for health care that it's being spent in ways that ensure that every canadian has access to high quality health care when they need it there's a lot of issues that are at the level of we can call them a crisis because they are but there's no simple solutions they're they're complicated and they're going to take again being honest with people and talking about it I want to turn to my last policy question before we get and talk about the Green Party and the future of the Green Party. And I want to ask about the Aboriginal and Indigenous people who mm -hmm. are on Can or on Turtle Island. Um, we are living in 2022, and I hate that I have to continuously pressure politicians and ask this question to politicians, but here we are. We have people living on boil water advisories from coast to coast mm -hmm. to coast. We mm -hmm. are a G7 nation, for God's sakes. And I say that as kindly as possible. Has Canada failed the indigenous people of this land? Absolutely. And and we get court cases that explain it. I mean, the, the court cases that say, look, the cumulative effects of all this expansion on your territory violates treaties. In the cases where there were treaties, the promises in the treaties weren't honored. In the cases where there weren't treaties, so it's unceded land and territory, it again has not been, there's been there's been a lack of respect for indigenous sovereignty. And it's it at the heart of it, of course, is that the Indian Act is the most racist piece of legislation you can imagine. And it was, I talked about how Norway followed Peter Lougheed, South Africa followed the Indian Act to create apartheid. So we need to actually be prepared. And I, I used to talk to Jody Wilson-Raybould about this a lot when she was in Parliament listening. What are we going to do? Because we have to get rid of the Indian Act. But some First Nations are so used to it as their system of governance because the colonial period is so entrenched that the traditional systems of sovereignty are no longer um, easily resuscitated, whereas other communities, like you look at Haida Gwaii and the Haida Nation, the, the matrilineal society, the way in which decisions were taken, hereditary leadership in Witsuit, and there's places where that's deep. So we have, I think we have to start Sorry, with I the real fundamental. I just want to jump on that, that statement that you just made there. Yeah. 
and I, I, I don't know how to pose this question correctly, so I apologize if it comes off as in a rude, a, a typical white guy question, but who do you listen to? We have hereditary chiefs and we have elected chiefs in Canada in mm-hmm. across this land. And we are seeing a divide with premiers listening to elected chiefs, some politicians saying we should listen to hereditary chiefs. At the end of the day, do we not need to listen to both elected chief and hereditary chiefs when it comes to issues of infrastructure projects like pipelines? Oh. You, you talked about the Wet'suwet'en Wet's uh, First Nations, yeah. and the hereditary chiefs are saying, no, we don't want the pipeline. The elected chiefs are saying, yes, we do. Who do we listen to? And I, I wanted to ask that question, and I apologize if it comes off insincere. I just want to know who should we no, be it's, listening it's- to? Well, as Canadians, I think we should listen to the Supreme Court of Canada because that's where we have rule of law. And the Supreme Court of Canada in uh, the Del, well, there have been many decisions, the Delka Mokahida, but um, on the Chilcotin decision, it was a unanimous decision and written by former Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, described the difference between a fee simple title, which is our colonial settler culture. We we know I bought this land, I own this land, right? And what what title looks like in, in an indigenous context, which is not personal and severable, but collective and intergenerational. So I think what we should be looking at is deep conversations that de- that really respect the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which Canada's Parliament has adopted, which the BC government has adopted. But then in the way it's operationalized, they will yeah, free prior and conformed, informed consent, except for when we've already made up our mind and we don't want to let you have a, a say it, crack it at it. Now, we, so we actually have to live up to Supreme Court of Canada decisions and the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which means complex, long discussions and listening a lot and making up for what you can never make up for hundreds of years of cultural genocide. But one thing we can start doing is land back. And where we have crown land, and while we say, okay, so the title here is collective and intergenerational, doesn't that work perfectly with the work we need to do to dovetail it with indigenous leadership on energy and climate solutions? So rather than pressing First Nations and offering, which is what happens along the pipeline route, well, you know, the, now the Trans Mountain Crown Corporation, our money at work, going into communities that are still saying, and nations saying, we will keep fighting this pipeline because we are we are on the Salish Sea. Our traditions, our culture depend on it being viable. It depends on the salmon. It depends on the whales. We don't want your tankers here. No. But the, the Trans Mountain Corporation keeps coming and saying, but you can get a benefit agreement. Words, we're going to give you cash now if you give up on these ideas that are so entrenched for you. It's very hard for council members in elected First Nations councils to keep turning away the money they're being offered because of a benefit agreement that's not free prior or informed consent. So it's it, there's your question is a really important one, Chris, and I'm not the right person to answer it because it should always come from Indigenous leadership, how we answer these questions. But it starts with being prepared to say, okay, what do Indigenous solutions look like? And Indigenous leadership, by the way, on forest fire prevention, if we've been following Indigenous management of, of our forests, there would have been controlled burns earlier that helped protect us. Now, if we look at indigenous leadership around renewable energy, it's amazing how much of the renewable energy installed in Canada in the last couple of decades is indigenous owned, indigenous led, and providing more than the power and the electricity that an indigenous community needs, it's providing it to sell into the grid. There's no excuse for, you're right, the boil water advisories, the absence of equal access to healthcare and education. If you're Indigenous, the overproportion of Indigenous peoples in our prisons, the overproportion of Indigenous women who are missing and murdered and were, but what, what is one of the things that the missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry said? Top pri- one of the top priorities is safe public transit. I mean, the women who've been missing and murdered, particularly along the Highway of Tears, is because they they don't have the economic wherewithal to own their own car. They're hitchhiking because there's no buses. We could improve our trains and buses and modernize our economy, by the way, as a G7 country and make them carbon neutral public 
transit that's affordable and safe and be addressing climate and justice and protecting women and girls and by the way also boys and men there's a lot we could do if we were serious about reading the recommendations that have been handed to Canada from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, from the Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women and Girls Commission. There were solutions for Indigenous justice that ha would have great impacts for everyone, but we're not doing them. I want to turn to our last segment because I'm just cautious of time here and our conversation has been so in-depth. I feel like we could talk for another hour about these issues. Easily. Exactly. I could. I well, don't know if you want to. <laughs> well, next time you're <laughs> when, when you're in Calgary next, we'll sit down, we'll have a coffee and we'll have, we'll discuss this. Well, one of the reasons I want to be leader of the Green Party or co-leader again is that I get to go to Calgary Stampede every year, which always made, made my vegan friends really angry. But Calgary Stampede is one of those community events that Canadians need to see how hundreds of volunteers, thousands of volunteers come together to make that party happen. So, yeah. I have lived in I Calgary for four years and I have not been to Calgary Stampede once. Well, COVID, was that the reason? Cancer, Gosh. cancer yeah. and COVID. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway. okay. I want to take you to Calgary Stampede. There you go. It's a date next year when you're co-leader. Well, I mean, you're... I've been I've been on the pancake griddle with Daniel Smith, and I'm gonna pancake duel any day, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I want to turn to the Green Party of Canada now. Um, I I think it's pretty obvious to say the Green Party has been in a interesting few years since you've left in 2019. You are coming back and you are looking to co-lead the party again. What are you hearing from members from coast to coast to coast in Canada about what they want from their next leader slash co-leader in a green mm -hmm. party of Canada? They just want us to get our act together. They don't understand any more than I do. Why when you, I mean, it was so long when I first started out as a Green and Green Party leader in 2006 to get any media coverage of the Green Party. And I hate to say now these days, I think, oh, oh no, not any more media coverage of the Green Party. So it's <laughs> we have to stop having stuff happen internally that does damage to our reputation, does damage to our caucus. We have elected members of parliament. That's not that easy. Think about how many parties there are out there that gave it their all, whether People's Party or, you know, you name it across the, the, the animal rights parties. There's lots of parties that are Elections Canada has said. These are, you know, registered political parties and they work hard. It's not a small thing in a first past the post country that we've had green parliamentarians at the federal level since 2011 with substantial green caucuses in four other provinces, including the official opposition in one. We are here to stay. And there is some damage occurring that, frankly, I won't understand it or be able to explain it to anyone else unless and until Jonathan Pedneau and I are in some form of leader and deputy leader until we enter co-leadership. Because a lot of this is, is very internal and members of parliament for the Green Party aren't part of the governance structures to understand what is going on, but I'm, I'm confident our financial health can be restored very quickly. I'm confident our public reputation can be restored very quickly and that we can say to people, because this is what I hear, for heaven's sakes, we don't want to hear about somebody's feelings were hurt and somebody else is mad at somebody else and none of it makes any sense to us. What's going on? I can't answer the question what's going on because I'm not on the inside, but I do know all the people involved and they're good people. So it should be fixable when we return to our normal process of consensus decision making and accountability for actions that should solve it so why you then so at the end of the day the million dollar question that a lot of people are asking themselves right now as they're about to go buy their memberships before october 17th? 19th okay. yeah they got to october 19th make sure you remember okay october 19th and then voting is in november so they have almost Five days, almost a week until the membership cut off. Well, six days as of today. 
Yeah. Why should people be buying memberships to potentially vote for you after listening to this interview, after listening to all your talk about uh, where the Green Party should move forward? Why should Elizabeth May and Jonathan Pednow be the next and first co-leaders of the Green Party of Canada? I think first and foremost, because we understand that the job of the leader is not to declare, I'm the leader and I'm taking us in this direction. No, it's it's a service role. It's an important service role. And it's it's driven by, as your first question suggested, a sense of duty. And it's with humility. So I would never say, look, the party needs me to lead it. Not at all. I feel the need for the Green Party to be stronger because I'm driven by climate action and my and and a, a very powerful sense as a grandmother of responsibility. I've got to do, I can't leave this mess for kids. I'm not, I'm the last person in the world who's ever going to say, oh, the next generation is going to be so much smarter than we are. They're not going to have a chance. The window closes on the livable world for them before they can vote. We've got to fix this ourselves. I, I'm always saying to boomers, people in my generation, rat, get a lot more radical. We've got to do a lot together. But what Jonathan and I offer is, and it's not any knock on the other candidates because we've got really strong candidates for leader, but we're the only team that offers an elected leader in parliament tomorrow because I'm there now. We're the only team that can offer working and job sharing so that we're rebuilding the party so we're election ready for the next federal election, but making a bigger difference in the life of this country right away through the teamwork that we offer and through building teams. It's not about me and it's not about, it's not about, you know, it's not a singular enterprise. It's a team effort. And our members at the grassroots know this. They're fantastic. They've stuck with us. Members know that when a convention happens, that's when they get to decide if they like the idea of co-leadership or not. Our platforms set out very carefully how, in respect of our current constitution, we can come forward as leader and deputy leader, go through the constitutional changes. And there are other reforms that I think we're going to need in governance structure because the party's very firmly committed to grassroots democracy, that the members make the decisions. But in between those biannual general meetings, which we used to have in person, how do you govern a party when, you're, when your governance structure is that the grassroots is in charge? Well, we need better mechanisms to more, thir more actually effectively plug in the leadership that comes from electoral district associations or what we used to call riding associations. We need to make sure that we're connecting what right now are a couple of silos that are operating without talking to each other. I don't know how well they talk to each other because as I said, I'm on the outside, but we, I know the caucus, the Green Party caucus of MPs isn't plugged into what's going on inside the party. That'd be a good decision to figure out how that works, how to make sure the council is plugged in to the electoral district association leadership on a meaningful basis. So those are things that will take a lot of conversation. I really hope people will join because at the other end of it, if you're not a Green Party member now and you're looking at politics in Canada, it's a dismal prospect of competing wedge issues. And we need to be grown-ups and able to talk to each other, reach out to each other, and make sure we're addressing the challenges which is a real challenge to democracies of disinformation, that we're able to stand up as global citizens who are really concerned about the fact that, yes, the war in Ukraine is horrific, and yes, Putin has to be pushed back, but we also are facing increased risk of nuclear war. And while this conflict is happening, we're not paying enough attention to the Rohingya Muslims and what's happening to them in, in what used to be Burma. We're not paying enough attention to Tigray and what's happening in Ethiopia. Canada has a role in the world, and Greens know how, as, a, as the only truly global party, we know how to step up and step into that space and actually help promote peace and promote sustainability and address the climate crisis for Canadians and for our kids and our grandkids and the whole planet's blessed creation of, of, of species beyond our own. Well... I want to thank you so much for this interview. Um, I could probably ask you millions of questions and I guarantee you people listening to this now or later on are yelling at their screen saying, why didn't you ask this question or why didn't you ask this follow up? Well, it's my show. I get to ask the question that I want to <laughs> ask. You want to start your own show? Go ahead. It's fun. I can tell you that much for sure. All the hate mail that I get. Um, 
how can people reach out to you? How can people learn more? How can people sign up? Yeah. I know I talked to you beforehand. Membership link is in the links below on YouTube. So check it out. If you're listening to this on yeah. the website, uh, the links in the show notes as well. But how can people reach yeah. out and ask you questions, Elizabeth? Well, in the leadership race, there's just like I was because I've got so many you know places that I exist online. There's my my nonpartisan website as a member of parliament, and then there's listen during the leadership race, go to Elizabeth May one word dot ca or Jonathan Pignol dot ca. We have we meet, meet elections Canada rules and Green Party rules. We're running separate campaigns. We have separate websites, but they're kind of mirror images of each other. En anglais, en français. I I I really I would be so grateful if people would have a look at some of the videos that uh, are online. Jonathan has also been a, a documentary filmmaker and past and a journalist, and it shows in the quality of of like just a one minute video of what we want to offer to people. Um, and then there's a place there you can write to campaign at elizabethmay.ca, but you can you can find all the links and ways to send questions through that site. And I encourage you, if you have a question and you're, if you were yelling at the screen at Chris, don't yell at Chris, send me an email uh, and, and we'll have a conversation. And uh, we will be continuing to have Green Party events. We're having town halls with each one of the candidates for leadership. Terrific, six candidates. And so far, I'm so proud of the quality of the conversation we're having as Greens because it's very collaborative and very focused on the positives of a future where the Greens are a bigger force in, in our parliament and able to encourage, as I said, respectful grown-up conversation. I want to thank Elizabeth for coming onto the show and doing this. Uh, the links to Elizabeth's Twitter, Facebook, website, email address, links to buy a membership, show notes. Scroll down, check it out. If you're listening to this, please pull over uh, if you're driving in a car and then do it <laughs> or wait till you get home. But the links are in the show notes. And I want to say this uh, to close this out because you're the last interview I have before our debate on October 23rd for the Green Party of Canada member, uh, leadership candidates. We put out a call for members, members and Canadians to submit their questions online through our website. And since we launched last week, we've had over 213, I just counted this morning, 213 questions that are going to be not posed all 213 to the member, to the leadership candidates, but I can tell you the Green Party membership and the Greens that the questions that we are getting range wide and far. So I'm looking forward. If you want to learn a little bit more, check out the website. Tune in on October 23rd for the debate. It happens at 430 Mountain Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 or 5. Wait, 6 p.m. Mountain Eastern Standard Time. 3 30 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. But Elizabeth, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure, and I look forward to chatting to you again when you're here in Calgary, but also for the debate on October 23rd. I'll see you then. It's been a long time since we met in Belleville, but uh, <laughs> we will catch up with each other again, and God bless you. Take care. Yes, yeah, so with that, before Elizabeth goes, I'm just going to say my outro here. Um, Put down social media. Take five minutes out of your day. Put down Twitter. Put down Facebook. Put down Instagram. Put down TikTok or whatever you use. And go have a conversation with someone. It helps our society. It helps our democracy. And it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Keep talking.